I want to thank Brother Austin for the fine job he did leading us in our singing. Thank Brother Roland for his wonderful words over the table. Thank Brother Rick for reading the scripture. Thank Brother Granville for his prayer and for all of our men, our brothers here, who have led us in our worship today. You've done a fine job with reverence for the Lord, and may God, may God bless you. As we begin our second lesson this morning from God's Word, I want to ask you to take a moment to imagine something in your mind. I want you to imagine an occasion, maybe in the near future, when everything as you know it changes forever. I want you to imagine a day when the unthinkable becomes a reality. A day when time as you know it ceases to exist. A day when that which seems far away comes near. A day when the world and everything that is in it, your home, your property, your car, your country, the world in which you live, it's all destroyed. It's all burnt up with, with fire and the Lord descends from heaven with his mighty angels and all the dead, they, they come out of the tomb. Brothers and sisters, I want you to imagine all of these things one day taking place because according to the Bible, they will one day all take place. According to the Bible, everything that I just described for you will actually take place on the last day the final day, the judgment day. The judgment day. Let me ask you something this morning. Are you ready for the judgment day? Are you ready for the last day? Are you ready for the most important day yet to come in human history? Are you ready for the judgment day as you sit there in the pew this morning? I don't know about you, but it is interesting to me how when I read the New Testament, I, I find the judgment day being mentioned over and over again. I mean, haven't you ever noticed that before? As you read your New Testament, have you ever noticed how Peter and James, the Lord's brother, and John and June, Jude and Matthew, they, they, they talk about the judgment day quite a bit. Jesus talked about the judgment day quite a bit. The Apostle Paul talked about the judgment day quite a bit. In fact, did you notice how Paul mentions the judgment day when he preached the gospel in the city of Athens? Did you notice that? Going back to the verses that Brother Rick read for us in Acts chapter 17. Go in your Bible to Acts 17. Going back to those verses. I want you to notice how in a place that was immersed in human philosophy and idolatry, in a place where the people had actually set up an altar that read to the unknown God, in a place where the majority of people were, were, were atheists, the Apostle Paul chose to educate them about the judgment day. I mean, out of all the things Paul could have talked about in this city, Paul chose to talk with them about the most important day yet to come in human history. And I guess the question is why? I mean, why did the Apostle Paul feel the need to preach a lesson about the judgment day, even though he was in a city where the majority of folks didn't even believe in the one true God? I mean, what did the, what did the Apostle Paul feel they needed to know about this day? What specific things did Paul want them to understand about this day? Well, I want to suggest to you this morning that there are at least five things that the Apostle Paul wanted these people to know about this day. There are at least five things that the Apostle Paul wanted these people in Athens to know and that he also wants us to know and understand about the judgment day. And the first thing is this. The first thing that the Apostle Paul wanted these people to know about the judgment day is, number one, he wanted them to know that it's going to occur. He wanted them to know that the judgment day, it is going to take place. Are you in Acts chapter 17? If you got your Bible, follow with me. As we start with verse number 30 here, as the Apostle Paul preaches the gospel, 
in his trip to Athens, he says in verse 30, Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent. Why? Verse 31, because he has fixed the day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. Let's just stop right there, if you don't mind. I want you to notice how, according to the Apostle Paul, one of the things that we all need to understand about the judgment day is, number one, we need to understand is it's going to take place. It's going to happen. Notice how Paul says that God has fixed a day. Some of your translations say that God has appointed a day. God has fixed a day. God has appointed a day. That language indicates that God is the one who has selected and invented the day of judgment. God is the one who has marked this day down in his mind. God is the one who has guaranteed that this day is going to take place. God has fixed a day. For the judgment day, and someone says, well, Sean, when exactly is this day going to take place? Well, my friend, there's no way for any of us to know that. There's no way for me to know that. And there's also no way for you to know that. You see, we got to understand that like with the return of Jesus and like with the end of the world, the judgment day is also going to take place like a thief in the night. The judgment day is also going to take place suddenly and unexpectedly. The judgment day is also going to be a moment in time where it occurs when God is ready. You see, as human beings, our responsibility is not to know exactly when the day of judgment is going to take place. No, as human beings, our responsibility is just to make sure we are ready to meet God if it happens on this day. Our responsibility is to make sure we're found faithful to God today, right now, because we don't know when we're going to die. And we also don't know when when God's going to execute what Paul is talking about in this verse. But Paul says that God has fixed a day. In which he's going to judge. And I guess that brings us to the next question we, we, we need to ask this morning, and that is when the judgment day takes place, who's all going to be judged? I mean, are Christians just going to be judged? Are members of the church going to just be judged? Are those in the world just going to be judged? Who's all going to be judged when this day takes place? Well, the Apostle Paul also answers that question in this verse. When you keep reading Acts 17 and verse 31, you see that when the judgment day takes place, God's going to judge the world. He's going to judge the world. And someone says, well, who is the world? Well, my friend, the world includes everybody. The world includes me. And it also includes you. It also includes everybody in your family. And everybody on your job and everybody in your neighborhood and everybody in your city, state and country. It also includes everybody in North America. And South America and Australia and Europe and Asia, it also includes everybody on planet Earth. It also includes everybody to have ever lived. I'm reminded of what the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. There Paul says, for we must all, A-L-L, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether it is good or bad. Notice how Paul says that all, every person is going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And then the Hebrews writer says this. He says, in as much as it is it appointed for men and the word men there is not just referring to adult males, but there is talking about mankind, male and female. It is appointed for mankind to die once. And after that comes the judgment. The Bible says it is guaranteed that we're going to appear before God in judgment. In fact, listen to what Jesus says. I want you to go in your Bible to Matthew 25. As I said earlier, Jesus actually talks a lot about the day of judgment throughout his ministry. This was something that was very important to Jesus, and it should be equally important to us today. In Matthew 25, in verse number 31, 
Here, I think Jesus is talking about a judgment day scene. And he says in Matthew 25 and verse 31, But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, and he will sit on his glorious throne, verse 32, all nations, notice that, all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, and he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Notice how, even though it is true that people, are different in so many different ways. Across this globe with the seven or eight billion people that make it up, we are different in so many different ways, and yet even though we have all these differences, there are at least two things we all have in common, and that is one day we're all going to die, and we're also going to appear before the Lord in judgment. We're all going to die one day, brothers and sisters. And we're also going to one day appear before the Lord in judgment. It doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter if you're a millionaire. It doesn't matter if you're a billionaire. It doesn't matter if you're the president of the United States or the governor of Arizona. It doesn't matter if you're some big Hollywood star or some world famous athlete. It doesn't matter if you're just some common American citizen like most of us in this room. It doesn't matter who you are or where you come from or what the color of your skin may be or what your background may be. You, my friend, have an appointment before the throne of King Jesus. You have an appointment. Before the throne of God, you have a day in which you will give an account of yourself to God. The Bible says the judgment day will take place. And on that day, God's going to judge the whole world. And for those who may be wondering how God is going to judge the world, let me just say that the Apostle Paul says that when God judges the world, he's going to judge it in righteousness. He's going to judge it in righteousness. What does that mean? Well, that means that on the day of judgment, there are not going to be any mistakes made. There are not going to be any mistakes made on that day because unlike with people on this earth, unlike with earthly judges, there's nothing we can hide from the great judge who is God. We can't hide our actions from God. We can't hide our words from God. Brothers and sisters, we can't even hide our thoughts from God. There's nothing we can hide from the living God. And I'm reminded of what Solomon says over in Ecclesiastes. Do you remember the last two verses of Ecclesiastes in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 13? Remember, as Solomon reaches the end of his quest to find happiness and fulfillment in life, he says, after I went through all these things, riches and fame and wisdom, he says, here's the conclusion. When all has been heard is fear God and keep his commandments, because this applies to every person. Some of your translations say this is the whole duty of man. The whole duty of man is to fear God and keep his commandments. And here is why. Verse 14, for God will bring every act to what? Every act of judgment. Everything which is hidden, whether it is good or whether it is evil. Notice how unlike what happens in our fallible justice system from time to time on the day of judgment. There's not going to be any mistakes made by the great judge who is God. They're not going to be any people who are truly guilty getting away with their crimes. They're not going to be any lawyers with high bar exam scores who are going to be able to stand before God and convince him to change his mind if we're found guilty. There's not going to be any bribing or trying to pay the judge off so we can get our way. There's not going to be any appealing the verdict. So maybe we can get an opportunity for a retrial. There's not going to be any opportunity for a retrial. There's not going to be any standing before God wondering if he got this thing right. You see, unlike what goes on in our American justice system on the day of judgment, on this day, you're not going to find any mistakes made by God. The Bible says that God, the great judge, is not going to make any mistakes. 
because he's God and he knows all things. And on this day, the scripture says he's going to judge the world in righteousness. He's going to get it right. He's going to execute a righteous judgment and he's going to execute it through one specific man. Do you see that? Going back to the verse, Acts 17, 31, God has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed. Question, who is this man? Who is this man that God is going to execute his justice through? Who is this man that we will have to stand before in judgment according to the verse? Well, brothers and sisters, the man that the apostle Paul is talking about here is no other than the Son of God, Jesus the Christ. Jesus, the Christ, is the person through whom God is going to judge the world. In fact, when we stand before Jesus on this day, we're going to hear either one or two things from him. We're either going to hear the best words we've ever heard in our lives, or we're going to hear the worst words we've ever heard in our lives. As Brother Granville said in his prayer, we're either going to hear, come, you who are blessed of my father inherit the kingdom that has been prepared for you for the foundation of the world. Or we're going to hear depart from me a curse once until the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. My dear friends, we're either going to hear one of those two statements. When we stand before the judge, Jesus. And let me tell you something, whichever statement he makes to us, whichever verdict he renders to us on that day, it's going to be absolutely right. It's going to be absolutely just. It's going to be absolutely righteous. As Paul says there in that verse. If we're casting the hell on that day, it's not going to be because it's not going to be because Jesus got it wrong with us. It's not going to be because he's been unfair to us. It's not going to be because he's not treating us correctly instead it's going to be because we died in our sins and he's given us exactly what he promised to give every person who dies separated from him the bible says the judge for day is going to take place and on that day god is going to judge the world through his son jesus christ and for those who may be wondering how we can be so certain this is going to happen let me suggest that that the scripture gives us the answer to that as well. Look back at the verse again very carefully. God has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Before we deal with the second part of that verse, I want to suggest something to you. I want to suggest that there really is no day of judgment. Like the atheist wants us to believe, then guess what? It really doesn't matter what we do, does it? I mean, think about it. If there's no day of reckoning, if there, is there, if there is no day in which we have to give an account of ourselves to a creator, then it really doesn't matter what we do. It really doesn't matter if we have sex outside of marriage. It really doesn't matter if we engage in drunkenness and if we lie and if we cheat and if we steal. It really doesn't matter if we even murder. You see, if there's no day coming in which we have to give an account of ourselves to a creator, then it really doesn't matter what we do. But again, the Bible emphasizes that there is coming a day of judgment. There is coming a day of reckoning, and God has given us evidence, solid evidence, to believe that. According to what the Apostle Paul says, the solid evidence that God has given us to believe in the judgment day is ultimately found in the resurrection of Jesus. But Paul says that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is God's proof. It is God's confirmation that the judgment day is going to take place. It is yet another reason why it was so vital that Jesus come out of that tomb 2,000 years ago. You see, in addition to the resurrection confirming his identity, 
In, a, in addition to confirming that God had put his stamp of approval on his on the morality he taught in his ministry. In addition to showing us that God was pleased with his sacrifice and in addition to. To validating everything Jesus ever taught. In addition to showing us that Jesus had power even on, over death, another reason why Jesus had to come out of that tomb is because his resurrection guarantees the day of judgment. His resurrection guarantees that the world is going to one day be destroyed by fire and that he is going to come back and we will stand before him. We will give an account of ourselves to God. Paul says that the ultimate proof God has given us to believe in the judgment day is the resurrection of Jesus. In fact, it reminds me of one of my favorite verses in the New, in the New Testament. You've heard me read this several times over the last few months. Romans 1 and verse 4, powerful verse. Romans 1 and verse 4, it says that Jesus was declared to be the son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. According to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Notice how here the Apostle Paul says that the resurrection not only declared Jesus to be the son of God, but it declared him to be the son of God with power. The son of God with power. Someone says power to do what? But my friend, power to do everything. Power to save us. Power to raise us up when he comes again. Power to watch over us. Power to forgive us. Power to hear our prayers. Power to mediate for us. Power to comfort us when we start going through trying times in our lives. Power to be with us this morning as we worship God in spirit and in truth. Power even to judge us. Power even to hold us accountable for how we've lived our lives. The Bible says that the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it guarantees, absolutely guarantees. That even though 2000 years have gone by, the day of judgment is coming. It is going to take place. It is guaranteed to take place. And I guess that leads us to our final question this morning. And that is, since we've been given assurance from God that the judgment day is going to take place, how should we respond to that? How should we respond to a coming day of judgment? Brothers and sisters, according to what Paul says in the text, the proper response to the judgment day is preparation. We need to be preparing ourselves for this great day since we don't know when it's going to take place. Since it could take place on this day, for all we know, we need to be getting, getting ready right now. That's the point Paul makes in verse 17 or chapter 17 and verse 30. Notice again how Paul says that in past times, God overlooked. He overlooked ignorance. But now under the new covenant. God is declaring to men that all people everywhere that they should repent. And why should they repent? Because, he says, God has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. Notice how why it is certainly good for us to have knowledge of the facts concerning the judgment day. According to the Bible, that knowledge doesn't do us any good if we don't apply it to our lives. Notice how, according to the Apostle Paul, the reality of the judgment day is actually intended by God to motivate us to live a certain way. It is actually designed by God to motivate us to repent of our sins. It is actually designed by God to motivate us to live holy before the Lord so we can be ready to appear before him in judgment. The judgment day is really designed to lead us. To living holy and godly lives. The question is, is the judgment day doing that for us? Is it doing that for me? And is it doing that for you? I mean, is, is the reality of this day provoking us to live right, to live holy, to surrender ourselves completely to the will of Jesus? I want to ask you to take out your Bible and go to one more place. Go to Matthew chapter seven, please. 
Go to Matthew chapter 7. I think here in Matthew 7, we find another judgment day scene. In fact, here, I think not only do we get a glimpse of what's going to happen on the judgment day, but we also see why it is so critical that we make sure we're prepared for it. And so in Matthew chapter 7, in verse number 21, as Jesus is getting ready to wrap up the Sermon on the Mount, he says in verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who's in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, the judgment day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I want you to notice a couple of very important observations from this text. First, I want you to notice how on the judgment day, there are going to be a lot of religious believers who stand before Jesus. There are going to be a lot of people who have spent their lives calling him Lord. And they have prophesied in his name. And they've cast out demons in his name and they've done many, many miracles in his name. Jesus says that on the day of judgment, there are going to be a lot of religious believers who appear before him expecting to go to heaven. And yet, even though they expect to go to heaven, Jesus says they're going to be in for a rude awakening. Jesus says they're not going to be going to heaven. They're not going to be saved. They're not going to be with God. And the reason why they're not going to be with God is, is because even though they were religious, even though they called him Lord, according to verse 23, they still practice works of lawlessness. They still practice works of iniquity. In other words, they still did things in their lives that were not in line with his will. Jesus says, now on the judgment day, there are going to be a lot of religious folks who are going to stand before him. And they're not going to be saved because they did not surrender to his will. The question is, how can we avoid being in that group? The question is, how can you and I make sure that on the day of judgment, we're not numbered with a bunch of religious folks who merely claim to believe in Jesus and yet they're still going to be lost. Well, the answer to that question is actually given by Jesus in verse 21 again. They're back at verse 21. Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, would enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does what? He who does the will of my Father who's in heaven will enter. Notice how on the judgment day, it's not going to be good enough just to have believed in Jesus. It's not going to be good enough to just have called him Lord and done some religious things and slapped his name on it. No, Jesus says here that the only people who are going to be allowed to enter into heaven on that day are those who have done the will of the Father. Those who have completely surrendered to the will of heaven. Jesus says those are the people who are going to enter into heaven on this day. <clears throat> so with that being said, let me ask you this morning, that if the judgment day occurred today, would you be in that group? Would you be in the group of the saved? Would you be in the group of the faithful? Would you be in the group of those who can appear before the Lord with confidence? I want to suggest to you that God wants every person in this room, I don't care who you are, he wants every person in this room to be able to stand before his son on the day of judgment with confidence. Did you know that? That's what the Bible says. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 17, it says, By this, love is perfected with us so that we may have what? Confidence. So that we can have confidence in the day of judgment because as he is, so also are we in this world. Notice how, according to John, God doesn't want his people to live in fear of the judgment day. 
God doesn't want his people to live their lives trembling over the judgment day. Instead of living our lives with fear and trembling, God wants us to have confidence. God wants us to stand before him one day with confidence. He wants us to have confidence that because we are his children, because Jesus died on the cross for our sins, because we've tried to live our lives as faithful to him as we could, he will be faithful to us. He will bring us into heaven and he will hold us close to him in his house as possible because he loves us. And because he is faithful to keep his promises. My friends, God wants us to have confidence as we prepare for the day of judgment. The question is, do you have that? Do you have confidence as you prepare for the day of judgment? If not, why not? Why don't you have confidence? Is it because you know you're not really living right? Is it because you know you're harboring some sin in your life? If so, Get that corrected this morning. Repent. Turn away from your sin. Come back to God and leave here with the confidence of knowing that if the Lord came back like a thief on this day, you would be ready to receive your reward. And if you're not a Christian, you never obeyed the gospel. It's time to it's time to make it right. It's time for you to do what is necessary to receive that confidence that comes to the child of God. Believe in Jesus. Turn away from your sin. Obey his commandment to be baptized in water for the forgiveness of your sins. Live your life with confidence because God is faithful. And if we can help anyone this morning get right with God and prepare for that great day that is to come, it will be our pleasure to do so. Come to the front right now. Let's stand. Let's sing.